Um, we do a couple open slots still in May if anyone's interested in giving a talk or um, always for next semester too, um, for the fall, that would be great. Just let me know. Um, so today we're going to be learning about probing the activation mechanism of heterotrimeric G proteins with multi-scan molecular simulations. Hey, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm Xin Xu Yao from uh, Ground Lab. And it's a great opportunity to me uh, to be here presenting our recent uh, studies on heterotrimeric G proteins. And we use the uh, so-called multi-scale molecular simulation technique. So, so G protein is a kind of a molecular switch which can uh, regulate intracellular uh, signaling by turn on and turn on or turn off the uh, signaling uh, with uh, uh, presenting uh, alternately the inactive state and active state. Um, actually, G protein is a nucleotide binding protein. So the transition from inactive and active state was uh, accomplished by uh, binding or unbinding of the uh, GDP and GTP respectively. So if you look at uh, the this legend, so the G protein actually uh, uh, trimer heterotrimer contains alpha subunit and beta gamma subunit. So the beta gamma subunit is uh, uh, always associated together. Um, but the upper subunit, which is uh, actually central part of the G protein, uh, can uh, associate and de-associate de from the beta gamma subunits depending on the nucleotide state. So if you look at the uh, critical structure of the upper subunit, you can see uh, actually this protein contains uh, two domain. Uh, the rest like domain is very similar. The structure is very similar to a small G protein called the RAS and contains a uh, um, very common uh, functional component called the P loop and switch regions, which is uh, common to many nucleotide binding proteins. And this is uh, another domain called the domain, which is uh, unique to heterotrimeric G protein. And uh, its function actually is still not clear. And you can see here, uh, this structure has a nucleotide bound in this uh, binding site, which is uh, in the interface of the two domains. Okay, so um, the signaling, uh, the intracellular signaling uh, mediated by G protein actually uh, involves the typical seven steps. Uh, starting with the uh, inactive state of uh, G alpha subunit, uh, which actually binds with the GDP state, uh, GDP nucleotide. Uh, it form a, it associated with beta gamma subunit in the inactive state and form a compact with a membrane receptor called GPCR. And the uh, external signaling can activate the GPCR, which uh, called the nucleotide exchange in the uh, alpha subunit of G protein. And uh, the nucleotide change from GDP to GTP, and the G alpha uh, is activated. So the active state, uh, the active G protein can uh, bind to effector, which is a downstream protein, and can uh, regulate the uh, <coughs> The catalysis of effector uh, can regulate uh, uh, chemical reactions catalyzed by the effector proteins. So uh, the nucleotide, uh, the GTP hydrolysis, which uh, usually uh, aided by uh, another molecule called GAP, uh, can uh, change the nucleotide from the GTP to GDP. So uh, the G protein will uh, be deactivated and the signaling stops. So it's uh, the inactive state, the inactive G protein can associate the beta gamma uh, subunit again and uh, restart the cycling. So this is a uh, uh, typical uh, signaling cycling by uh, G protein. So you can see uh, during this cycling, uh, uh, many many uh, <laughs> proteins are involved in the interaction, and it's uh, 
uh, quite a complicated process. Okay. So um, actually about this uh, cycling, uh, this particular uh, system has been studied for many years, but still uh, the, the details of the underlying metrics is not clear, especially uh, about the, maybe I'll go back, uh, especially about the, how the nucleotide change from the inactive GTP state to active GTP state. So this uh, activation process actually is also a rate limiting step of the, about this uh, chemical reaction scheme. So in this study, uh, what we are trying to uh, to do is to decipher the key uh, molecular mechanism of G protein activation. And specifically, we are uh, trying to characterize uh, distinct act, uh, active and the inactive conformations and how this conformation transitions uh, in each step. And also, we are trying to uh, understand uh, allosteric, which means uh, how the nucleotide binding and the GPCR binding and the effector binding are coupled together. So, which uh, you involve the dynamics of protein dynamics. And third, we try uh, to uh, use this knowledge to, uh, to make some predictions, to, to know how uh, the, uh, specific mutations or small molecule binding can perturb the G protein signaling. <laughs> so this, this is uh, our uh, aim. Uh, to get to, uh, to achieve these aims, there are multiple possible uh, approaches. Uh, one is uh, for experimentalists, uh, you can do the uh, crystallography to get uh, the structures of the, the atomic details to look at the protein structures. And actually, th this study has been uh, performed for many years, and we get a lot of protein structure about the G protein. But this method still. Uh, it's quite time consuming and, uh, and it's very expensive. And also this can give you a static uh, snapshot about the protein conformation. There's no dynamic picture. Uh, ultimately, uh, you can do an NMR experiment to get the dynamic information. But these methods are uh, usually confined to uh, small proteins. So it's uh, uh, limited to the system size. And also, it's quite time consuming and expensive. So, uh, for, for us, uh, we are looking, uh, we're focused on uh, computations. So, we can, uh, for this particular system, we can use a kind of a multi scale computation modeling, like a molecular dynamic simulation or co screened methods, uh, like the elastic net mode, elastic net mode model and the normal model analysis. So, so, so now, uh, what is the multi-scale modeling? So actually, uh, uh, the multi-scale problem is actually uh, a common uh, phenomenon in biology. And uh, we have, uh, actually, in this field, uh, people have developed uh, different measures for different scales. Like, uh, uh, this is a look at the chemical reaction. And it's really considered the, the motion of electron. So this, we need to do a quantum mechanical calculation. And it's a uh, uh, very small uh, length scale and time scale is picosecond. And the second scale, uh, we look at uh, the atom motions. So for this, we can get uh, uh, protein conformation change and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, usually performed by classical molecular dynamic simulations. And also, this uh, cost grain modeling and simulation can uh, study the, uh, the molecular assembly and the remodeling. So it's kind of larger scale and a larger time scale, larger length scale and time scale. So, <coughs> so this is a, a kind of uh, exciting event. Uh, you know, the last year, the Nobel Prize in chemistry was uh, awarded to these three renowned professors. And actually, their uh, contribution 
uh, their major contribution is to develop a multi-scale model for complex chemical system. And uh, actually, their uh, major contribution is uh, focused on these two levels, the uh, quantum mechanical calculation and the uh, MD simulations. So the, uh, in this work, we are actually focused on the atomic level and the cost screen levels. So it's a uh, scale. Uh, OK, so this is uh, the tools and techniques we are uh, using for this study and also an outline of today's talk. So we are using the principal components analysis called PCA to uh, characterize uh, the nucleotide dependent conformations. And also we performed MD simulation to uh, something, the conformation change. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, uh, also uh, apply the cold screen, kind of cold screen method normal mode analysis to uh, get the dynamic information <coughs> from uh, the uh, protein structures and try to understand the, uh, the L3 in these particular systems. <coughs> so these two methods, the MD simulation and normal mode analysis, you can see the MD simulation is uh, still limited to the nanosecond to microsecond simulation. So it's uh, still a uh, time consuming process. But normal mode analysis, it's very fast. You can get uh, the result in seconds for uh, many structures. So it really can help us to, uh, but, but still, it's very fast, but still give uh, us the information about the dynamics. So it's really a uh, useful tool for uh, understand protein function. OK, so uh, first I'm going to talk about the PCA. So this is a, a well-established uh, status too um, in the multivariate statistics. And uh, it's uh, very commonly used in finding the patterns in high-dimensional data. And one uh, advantage of these techniques is to can, can do uh, dimension reduction. It's uh, mapping the high-dimensional data into a lower-dimensional uh, space, but still remain the major uh, <clears throat> information of your data. So for example, you look at this uh, two-dimensional data, you uh, have two variables which is apparently correlated to each other. So if you using this uh, variable as uh, uh, also a coordinate, you, you can uh, get uh, major inf information in each individual variables because they are actually correlated. But PCA can uh, find the, the maximal uh, various axis and the, the linear transformation for these two variables and finding a new uh, coordinate for, for your data. So after this transformation, you get uh, uh, called so-called principal component axis which captures the major uh, data variance. So, so after this uh, transformation, you can just use in one dimension to represent <coughs> your originally two-dimensional data, but without losing too much information. So this is a um, typical feature of, of PCA. OK. So what we did is, uh, applying this um, technique to the protein structures. Um, so the protein structure, as you know, it's usually the high dimension data. It's not actually it's not just a three dimension. It's a three n dimension. Um, n means the number of atoms. So it's really a high dimension. So what we did is uh, we get all the PDB structure from uh, database, and we superpose these structures and based on some particular position, which we call the core positions. Uh, this position is kind of uh, structure invariant and very rigid. So this, we use this position as reference to superposed structures and we did PCA. And we can get, what, what, uh, what we can get is uh, uh, the principal component axis which uh, measures uh, left motion of your 
protein. And also the variance along each PC, so you know how much uh, structure variance you captured in this PC. And more importantly, we can uh, project your data into a low dimensional principal component space. So you can see the clustering of uh, the structures. <coughs> so this movie shows uh, the input of this PCA. So you can see the superposed structure. Uh, they, are, have, uh, they have quite similar topology. Uh, but some regions are kind of uh, variable. So you can, they are uh, actually distinct. Uh, they, they are different structures. But from this superposition, you can't find the distinct conformation because they are kind of continuous move in the structure. This is uh, uh, the result of PCA. This coloring uh, is based on the clustering of PC, PCA. So you can see, um, so really uh, find, find out the uh, distinct conformations um, like so you see this uh, large variance region. You can see this uh, clustering of structures clearly uh, separated. So, question. Okay. So yeah. you just mentioned you set up a different uh, restriction before you actually do a superposition, right? Will you get the same result or similar result if you remove that restriction? Uh, you mean this restriction yes. for superposition? Um, uh, yeah, that's a, actually a good question. So uh, actually, the PCA somehow uh, depends on the, the position you are choosing. So that's why we, we, here we choose the uh, core position, which is uh, uh, trying to identify the position which are rigid. They, are, they, they don't move relatively. So these are rigid region, and then we can capture the, the, the flexibility of, of non-rigid regions. So for, for example, if you uh, superpose the structure based on the entire system, entire uh, carbon alpha atoms, so you can you know you can uh, observe the the motions of the domain. Uh, if you have two domain protein, you can observe the domain motion. But uh, using this core uh, position fitting, you can actually to to say the flexibility of uh, the the relative flexibility of the, the motions. So. Yeah, it's really depend on the, the, the position you are choosing to, to fit. But here we, we choose this position because they are rigid. Yeah. So, so here is a, um, the projection of the PDB structures from the three and high dimensional to this just two dimension. We call it PC1 and PC2. And uh, you can see the, uh, it captures uh, over 60% uh, of the structure variance. And uh, this, you can see on this plane, the PDB structure uh, clearly separated into uh, distinct conformations, distinct uh, clusters. And uh, we uh, we can we can color in this structure by the the prior priory knowledge, which is the nucleotide binding uh, in this structure. You can see actually this clustering uh, really uh, dependent associated with uh, nucleotide state. So the GTP is located here, and the GDP is uh, kind of larger spreading out, but they are clearly separated. So which means the PCA can find a distinct conformation cluster which uh, are related to the nucleotide state. And also, uh, from this map, you, if you look at the GDP cluster, you can see actually they, they have a kind of subgrouping, like this cluster and this cluster. Actually, we found this subgroup, uh, subgrouping related to the uh, a particular state called GDI state, which is a GDP dissociation inhibitory state. So this structure, all of this structure, uh, complex with uh, uh, a small peptide called uh, G, uh, GDI. So actually, w when we did PCA, we, we don't have such information. We just have the structure. But PCA can uh, automatically give you the information of cluster, which uh, really related to the 
the protein state. Okay. So uh, next, I'm gonna to talk about the the normal mode analysis. Uh, uh, we try to because the PC look at the structure, so we, which is uh, conformation. And normal mode method is a kind of a simulation method. So we can get a dynamic picture about the structure. So <coughs> the normal mode analysis is another uh, well-established method, which uh, based on the cost sprint uh, modeling called elastic network model. Uh, for each amino axis, we uh, pick up just one uh, atom based on the carbon alpha atom in position. So each uh, amino acid will represent it just by one sphere. So it's a radio level cost screen. <coughs> and we put uh, a screen between the residues. So it's basically the energy function is uh, harmonic potential. So which one do you pick? So, and in, in this any functions are uh, the only parameters we need is uh, spring constants. And uh, actually, there are uh, multiple different ways to get these parameters. <coughs> in particular, we are using a method developed by Hensi in 2000. Uh, this Spring constant uh, basically uh, what's called what uh, get by fitting to a uh, atomic uh, atomic model of uh, one protein example. So this uh, in here uh, in internally is a multi-scale modeling method. And uh, because this, this energy uh, <coughs> function is very simple, it's just a harmonic, so we can actually solve the uh, the equation of motion and electrically. And uh, if you have some uh, background of physics, you, you may know that for this uh, potential energy, the solution of the motion is uh, kind of a set of uh, harmonic motions of all the, uh, uh, with a particular frequency. So for each uh, frequency, all the atoms are moved Together. So it's called the resonance. And uh, to get this kind of uh, motion, equation of motion, uh, we just uh, uh, to solve the eigenvalue problem of this Hessian. And uh, the eigenvector related to the collective motion of the atoms, and the eigenvalue related to the uh, uh, spectral frequency uh, under these uh, motions. So each collective motion called a normal mode. So it's, uh, that's why it's called a normal mode analysis. Uh, okay. So with the uh, solution of, uh, with the equation of motion, we can calculate many uh, you know, quantities, uh, especially the, the average of the quantities and the uh, thermodynamic system. So here we are particularly interested in the two Quantities. One is the Pearson uh, correlation between the red pairs. Um, so actually, this, this formula, um, w once you get the, uh, uh, w once you diagonalize the Hessian and get the eigenvector and eigenvalue, you can easily calculate the correlation based on this formula. So you can see this is the inverse of Hessian, and this inverse Hessian actually is related to the outer product of the eigenvectors. So it's, uh, it's just do the calculation once, and you can calculate this quantity. And also, similarly, the fluctuation is very easy. So the, all the calculations are very fast. OK. So, so here, um, uh, I, have, I have talked about the, the classical number mode uh, analysis method. Uh, actually, uh, in previous work, this method usually uh, was applied to just a single structure, uh, which actually uh, assumed that uh, this method is uh, 
it's not so sensitive to the protein structure. Uh, but actually, um, this method is really dependent on protein structures. So you can get some uh, moles on one structure, and if you apply the method to another, uh, the same protein but different, a little bit different uh, conformation, actually the moles are different. So that's why we uh, develop a new <coughs> method called ensemble normal mold analysis. It's basically just uh, we, we don't use a single structure uh, to look at the, uh, the motions. We actually apply the method to all the PDB structures. And what, what we are uh, trying to do is using this method to, as a probe to get the information of the, to get the dynamic information underlying each individual structures. So, uh, so this, this is a kind of uh, a uh, very simple uh, step. We just get the input of the structure, and you can get the output, which contains uh, uh, the motions uh, of your system. And also, based on the formula, you can get the radio fluctuation and the radio radio correlations. So, okay, so um, this is a uh, comparison between uh, two distinct uh, protein states. Got uh, actually it's a uh, GDP and GTP, so it's a nucleotide dependent state. And uh, we found that the dynamic information, uh, particularly the radio fluctuation itself, can find the difference of this <coughs> two states, uh, specifically. We found the, the switch region and the P-loop region, which are actually the functional component of this system, are significantly more flexible in the inactive GDP than uh, the active state. And you can see this, this is a region of the switch and the P-loop, which are uh, very close to the binding site. So also we can compare the residue fluctuation uh, between the deactivated GTP and the inhibitory state. This, this is uh, uh, actually uh, more interesting to us because we found some uh, particular region uh, that is not reported previously. So basically, um, this GDI state has an even more flexible switch regions, but it's relatively uh, conserved helical domain, which is uh, uh, between this loop the, uh, between this uh, alpha E and alpha 5, this loop is located here. So this region is, uh, the functional role is still not clear. There's no report about this loop. And, uh, but it's uh, uh, from the thickness conservation, we found actually the, uh, there are three particularly residues that are highly conserved. So it might be uh, related to the protein function, but uh, the, the detail of the mechanism is still not clear. So, uh, but it's very interesting to explore further about this loop, how this loop can inhibit the, the uh, G protein signaling. So this is a very interesting question. Uh, okay. So, so that, uh, then um, we look at we look at uh, higher uh, level dynamic uh, quantities called radio radio couplings, and this. Uh, actually, the calculation can give you a, a kind of a matrix that looks like this. Um, each point here uh, shows uh, coupling strings for the radio pairs. Uh, along. And so each, each, each column and each row uh, represent the radio positions. So you see the, the couplings and the, the positive coupling and the, the uh, the correlation, the, the positive correlation and the negative correlation the regions. And actually, this is just the one uh, protein structure. We can get uh, every, for every structure, we can get a similar uh, <coughs> result. But so really, uh, if you just look at this uh, correlation matrix, it's really hard to, to find the, the difference among different structures. It's almost, uh, 
say. Actually, uh, that's because the, there are many regions are very similar because they are basically the same protein. But the structure, uh, structure difference uh, reflects some different couplings difficult to find in this uh, original correlation matrix. So what we did is just put this uh, matrix together and we calculate the variance along each position in this matrix. So we can basically find uh, out which region are highly variable and which is uh, kind of conserved. So this come up with this uh, covariance matrix, which the position of uh, matrix is exactly the same as uh, the correlation matrix. But the values here, this point, reflect uh, large various regions uh, in the correlation. So what we uh, found is uh, the interesting thing is all of the large various regions related to the functional uh, components. Like uh, this region, you can say it's a coupling related to the coupling of S2 and uh, uh, S3. And uh, this is S1, S2, uh, S1, S3, and S1, S2. And this region is a P loop to the switch 1, switch 2, switch 3. So basically, this region is uh, uh, the coupling between the uh, the uh, conserved functional components in the nucleotide binding protein. And also we found uh, some uh, couplings uh, are kind of variable in the hypodomain, which is uh, related to actually, if you remember, the, the radio fluctuator network is also involved the loops that, that were interested in this region. And also the interdomain coupling. So basically these three particular regions are uh, uh, the interesting region identified with uh, to look at the variance of the correlation. But the problem is here we still uh, can uh, can see uh, how these variable regions can distinguish different protein uh, structures or protein states. This is quite similar to the uh, you know, p why we did the PCA on, uh, on the uh, protein structures, because if you look at the superposition of protein structure, you can't see the, the difference of uh, or the, uh, the cluster of the protein uh, conformations. But here it's similar. You, you, you can see the variance region, but uh, you don't say uh, how this particular region uh, can distinguish different protein uh, states. So what we did is uh, similar to uh, analysis of axis structure. We did a PCA on the, the correlation matrix, which come up of this, uh, the plot, the projection of PDB structure onto a PC space based on the correlation matrix. And this is can be compared to the PCA of axis structure. You can see uh, with uh, considering the dynamic information, we can actually get a better clustering of distinct uh, protein states. Uh, you can see, it's particularly this GD, uh, GTP state, uh, is not separated into two subgroups. It's here. And interesting is we found these two subgroups actually related to the, also the protein function. This subgroup is uh, called um, the, the G protein uh, subfamily called GT, and this is uh, another subfamily called GI. So they are actually uh, uh, clearly separated in the uh, correlation PCA. And also interesting is we found here is an isolated point uh, from the GDP state. And we look at the original PDB file, we found actually this is a unique uh, mutation called G. Uh, this this is uh, actually in the P loop nuclear binding site. It's a mutation of a uh, glycine to a uh, arginine. So it's a uh, it's kind of inactive uh, mutation. Uh, it's reported that this mutation can cause uh, the uh, constantly inactivation of the G protein. So so by uh, considering the dynamic information, we really can find more 
look into more uh, distinct protein uh, states. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, now, uh, based on this PCA of correlation, we can uh, even further uh, to find out what kind of coupling can distinguish uh, each particular state. So basically, we uh, look at uh, the first uh, principal component. And uh, this, uh, showing, uh, th this value showing uh, uh, what kind of coupling contribute to this uh, particular direction of the PC. And if it is positive, means if you along this direction, along the PC1 direction, you basically get a stronger coupling on this particular region, which is, for example, here. And if you go to the opposite direction, you get a stronger coupling in this uh, uh, pink region, which is related to here. So you can say uh, in the negative direction, the GTP active state is uh, more, uh, has a stronger coupling in this particular region, which is uh, actually is, uh, the functional regions. The switch one, uh, coupling switch three, and switch two, three, three, and also the pillow. So, which is the active state has a strong coupling in this uh, functional state. And also, uh, in the, uh, ultimately, you can find a strong coupling in the GDI inhibitory state, which is related to the regions in the hydrogen domain here, and also the interdomain uh, coupling. So, this is a uh, very interesting because. Uh, the GD, GTP we know uh, is very likely the GP release related to uh, a domain opening. So the, this state, particular state called the uh, GTP release inhibitor state, so it has a unique coupling of the interdomain uh, between the two domains. So it's really uh, can explain why uh, this particular state, uh, the GTP release was inhibited. So, and that can also explain why your fluctuations were less in your active state, your GTP state, right? Because all these, oh yeah, are calling S one, S two, S three are all. That's right. That, yeah, this is you're you right. Yeah, the yeah the relative fluctuations is also uh, stable in the active GTP state. So it's because of this highly dense the coupling between these functional components, and it's also related. To the particular uh, purpose of this state, because it need to find the uh, factors, so you need a stable functional binding site for partner molecules. So, an alternative way to uh, interpret uh, the correlated matrix is uh, uh, using a dynamic network net, which is uh, actually different from the PCA. Uh, we are not looking at uh, the PCA is looking at the variance of local couplings, but the dynamic network kind of clustering of the uh, relative, relative correlations. So each particular uh, local uh, co correlation variance can potentially cause the global change of your uh, community structure. So here community means uh, the, uh, a group of radios that highly coupled together. And uh, between communities, the radio, radio coupling is kind of weaker. So we can we can here it show uh, example of the network net result with um, for three a particular states uh, and interestingly we actually so we can get the consistent result at uh, PCA uh, of correlation and you can see the GTP state has a kind of unique uh, com communities which couples the functional P loop and switch region here and also the, the unique coupling between two domains in the GDI state. So, okay. so uh, and I showed the normal model analysis really help us to get uh, into the dynamics of the protein structure, but it still has some limitations, like uh, it assumes uh, uh, actually the calculation of the normal model analysis is near the energy minimum, so it's uh, kind of captures the behavior near the native state like this. And also, but actually, uh, the protein function 
uh, usually involve a complementary change between uh, one minima to the other minima. So it's, uh, it's difficult to capture simply number more than that. And secondly, it assumes the harmonic potential. So, but in reality, if you look at this minima, it's, uh, it's potentially <coughs> the analysis is very large. So this is a, a different picture from the, this simple model. So what do we need to do uh, if we want to describe this com complicated energy landscape, we need a more accurate model which uh, come up with uh, MD simulations. So next I'm talking about MD simulations and we try to get uh, uh, confirmation change of this g -code. So. Uh, I'm not, uh, I, I don't want to bother with the uh, uh, NG function of MD simulation because there are a lot of tutorial online and uh, it's, uh, it's already have been developed for many years. But here is uh, just a very brief uh, review of the history of MD simulation. Actually, the first MD simulation uh, come up in 1977 and it's very short. Uh, MD simulation just picoseconds, but still it's um, very impressive at that time because at that time people still uh, even didn't think about the protein motion. Uh, the protein internally has a very uh, noisy and motions, so it's really uh, impressive to look at the real protein atom atomic motions in uh, computer. And nowadays. Uh, Actually, the computer power increased very fast, so we can reach much, much larger time scales, like the very famous DE shock group. They, they build a special machine for MD simulation. They can get uh, uh, typically micro scale, uh, microsecond scale simulation, even millisecond, millisecond scale for small projects. So it's really uh, impressive. And uh, the question we are interested in is. Uh, the complement change of G protein during the activation. So this uh, picture shows uh, a very new crystal structure, um, which actually uh, in uh, apple state, this yellow is a uh, it's a new structure. Uh, it's in apple state without nucleotide binding, and it's complex with uh, activated GPCR, and also associated with beta gamma subunit. So it basically is uh, ready for the GTP binding. And this is compared to the gray colored structure, which is a, a conventional uh, GTP bound state. You can see there is a large opening of this helical domain. So it's really, um, uh, the helical domain motion is really related to the, the nucleotide exchange. So our question is, uh, uh, can we really simulate this large complex change uh, by MD simulations? So the first, we look at uh, the previous simulation work on this particular system. And uh, the problem is actually no one directly observes the domain, op uh, domain opening. So um, what we did is uh, we don't use um, simply the conventional MD. We use a kind of enhanced MD simulation method, which uh, basically modified energy landscape by increase the uh, um, energy potential, the, the, the potential energy near the, en uh, the minimum, energy minimum. So you get the lower uh, energy barriers. So the system can sampling the complement change much easier. So this is kind of a modified energy landscape, but it's very useful for complement sampling. And also we use the GPU computing, which is uh, uh, review, uh, was reviewed to be much, much faster than single CPU core simulations. So with this combination of enhanced technique, we uh, finally uh, real, uh, simulate, really simulate the domain opening by uh, looking at, if you, yeah, I can show the screen. So you can see, start from the open, the closed stage, it's uh, really, can see the opening of this helical domain uh, to some extent. Yeah, okay. So, okay. 
Okay, so if you if you look at, we can also uh, look at the trajectory on the PC space. So you can see really the MD simulation uh, some large space approaching these new crystal structures. And compared to the simulation with nucleus and bind, um, it's really a uh, lot of structure in the closed state. So uh, the protein, the open state, is really acceptable to protein conformation, but the nucleotide uh, can, mod can uh, uh, alter, alternate, uh, can alter the stability of this closed open state and the stabilize protein the closed state. This uh, uh, finding, and also, uh, okay, so maybe I can I can give this. So. Uh, before I uh, do uh, concluding my talk, I, I want to introduce one uh, software which uh, is under developing our laboratory called Bio3D. Actually, it's a very uh, start this project back to 2006, and now it's still under actively developing. Uh, and uh, this this software was written in R, and uh, it can perform many uh, useful like protein sequence structure and simulation, uh, it, it can perform the analysis on protein sequence structure and simulation data. And uh, recently, we are uh, going to release uh, the most uh, uh, the newest uh, version, which contains a normal model analysis and also uh, the dynamic network analysis, which is a really uh, feature uh, in this package. And if you are interested, you can look at this uh, the page to get the uh, documentation and uh, the source code. So okay, so finally I summarize my talk. So we uh, we found the, the PCA is really a useful method for uh, characterize the protein uh, structures, especially for large, high dimensional data sites. And um, we developed a, a new idea. Of application of normal mode analysis, which is called ensemble uh, NMA, and we find the, the distinct dynamics of different protein states. And also, the new uh, dynamic network analysis can uh, interpret uh, the uh, radio, radio correlation in an um, um, efficient way. So, it potentially can help us to uh, really uh, understand the aleatory of this uh, system. And also, uh, all of these methods are uh, public available in Bound 3D. And also, we uh, did MD simulation, especially the uh, enhanced accelerated MD simulation with GPU calculation to sample the large scale uh, opening motion of G proteins. And in future, we are going to uh, get uh, some predictions based on this knowledge to. Uh, Maybe collaborating with the experimentalists to uh, test some mutations or small molecule binding, and to see how this uh, event can uh, perturb the conformational change or elastic regulation of G proteins. So, yeah, I, I would like to thank to uh, Barry, uh, my PI, and uh, he helped me uh, a lot in the last uh, one and a half years, and also Dr. Uh, and also Guido, which is very uh, a lot of beneficial discussion on the dynamic network analysis and the uh, G proteins. And also, I would like to thank to Hong Yang and Andrew and Shashank for the many helps. So I thank you for your attention. Getting lost. I had a quick question. Um, yeah. So, was that um, like the SNN six structure or whatever the the new domain mm -hmm. open structure? Did you project that into the old PC space, or did you include that when you were no? This is just driving the. What's that? This is the mapping to the old PC space. Okay. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's. A, we don't redo the PC. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so this structure kind of came along, this hyper open structure came along, and after we started the analysis, and we'd seen this large scale opening in the AMD. Make sure we say, whoa, what do we make of that, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of unusual. 
that along can be structured. It shows the same opening motion. So you're kind of being predictive of this opening motion, but weren't sure what to make of it at the first yeah, yeah. And, well, that was cool. But it is pretty controversial. A lot of folks don't believe that this opening motion can really occur to that extent. Yeah, so it's true. It's, some people don't believe this is a functional relevant. But I don't. So you did a lot of superpositions. How, how many structures do you need to be able to do a procedure like this? Uh, so to determine the movements, you you superimpose a whole bunch of different uh, your 53 raw PDB structures. Uh, yeah, for PCA we. Right. So how how many like would you really get the same result with like 20 of them? Uh, I think 20 of them. Yeah, it's really depends on how which which 20 you are choosing. Like if you choose GTP, the result potentially different because uh, it can 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 capture the this variant. So it's uh, basically uh, yeah, it's can be changed. But if you pick up 20 from 10 from this and 10 from this, for example, maybe the PC is kind of similar because the structure variance is majorly uh, uh, in the the nucleotide dependent uh, difference. So yeah, maybe you can get similar results, but it really depends on the, what kind of subset you are choosing. Well, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks.